Welcome to another episode of Life from Karbala, where we, inshallah, will discuss, uh, similar to the previous episode, uh, we have discussed the most emphasized topics within the Holy Quran. Uh, for the respected viewers who didn't get the chance to view the episodes, can go on our YouTube channel at Al Hussein 3 TV uh, to check out the latest ups, uh, uploads and videos uh, of Life from Karbala. <clears throat> so, uh, tonight, inshallah, uh, we will continue the series uh, with our very special guest, Sayyid Hussain Al Qazwini. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyidina. Wa alaikum, wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Sayyidina, similar to the previous episodes that we had, uh, all of the topics that we discussed are significant to the month of Ramadan because uh, when we actually learn from them, they bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, especially we're broadcasting from the two shrines. Uh, of Mount Hussein al-Abbas, peace be upon them. Uh, but tonight specifically, uh, we're, going, we're going to talk about concealing the truth in the Quran, insha'Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, states within the Holy Quran um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbid the Jews from concealing the truth and switching it with falsehood. And also, uh, they hid the truth from the believers so they wouldn't um, get to embrace other faiths except for Judaism or Christianity. Um, so how did the Jews and Christians back then uh, conceal the truth and what was the truth? A'udhu billahi minash shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allah states in, in the Holy Quran, inna alladheena yaktumuna ma anzalna min al-bayyinat wal huda من بعد ما بينه للناس في الكتاب أولئك يلعنهم الله ويلعنهم اللاعنون. We see uh, this theme of concealing the truth, those who conceal the truth, and it reoccurs in the Quran several times. At least, according to my knowledge and my research, we have at least five verses, five various times. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about those who concealed the truth. Those who knew the truth uh, about Allah's message, about Allah's prophets, about what Allah has ordained and ordered and for, forbidden mm -hmm. or forbade, yet they concealed it. They concealed the truth. We see at least five verses. Five, five times. The verses, as we shall see, they clearly speak to the people of the book, mm -hmm. Jews and Christians. Whenever Ya Ahl al-Kitab or the people of the book are mentioned, Ahl al-Kitab, it means Christians and Jews. However, I believe that uh, these verses have a, an outer meaning and an inner meaning. Mm -hmm. The outer meaning are the Christians and Jews, as we shall see. Those who were prior to Islam. The Quran warns them that why are you hiding the truth? And there's an inner meaning. There's an inner meaning that inshallah, as we progress in the program tonight, in the presentation, we'll talk about the inner meaning of this verse. Now, as for Christians and Jews, we see several verses that tackle they tackle this, this problem that they had of concealing the truth about Islam, concealing the truth about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Um, First of all, we know for a fact, mm -hmm. we know for a fact that in the Torah and in the Injil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mentioned Rasulullah Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad al He had mentioned him. He had mentioned his name. Uh, perhaps um, with the name of Ahmed or other names. He had mentioned his qualities, his descriptions, uh, his looks, his demeanor, his behavior, his manners, even his actions, what he eats, what he doesn't eat. This has all been mentioned either in the Torah or the Injil, or in other scriptures that 
Jews and Christians had. Jews and Christians had. Not just about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Even about our Imams. Even about Imam Ali. We believe that the qualities of Imam Ali have been mentioned in Al-Tawrah and Injil. In other books such as Al-Zabur, other Imams have been discussed. Imam Al-Mahdi Ajjalallahu Ta'ala Faraja has been discussed in these books. The Quran tells us, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عَبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ That we have, been, we have mentioned in, in the Zabur, which is the, the book of David. Mm-hmm. After Al-Dhikr, Al-Dhikr was another book that belonged to another prophet. That what? That my righteous servants will inherit this earth. They will rule this earth. Meaning, Imam al-Mahdi ta'ala faraj. Thus, we believe that all of our beliefs have been mentioned in a Torah and Injil. All of the prophets, all of the 124,000 prophets that, became, that came before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa they foretold about his coming. Mm-hmm. They foretold about his uh, prophethood. وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ This is, the Quran tells us, Isa alayhi salam, وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ Ahmad. I will tell you about a prophet that will come after me. His name is Ahmed. Ahmed is one of the names of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What happened with the people of the book, Christians and Jews, specifically Jews, and even some Christians, the rabbis, the monks, the priests, these verses that address, that foretell about the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they either took them out, plainly took them out, or they distorted them. They distorted them in a way that it won't seem like the verse is speaking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa The Quran warns them. In one verse, Ya ahl al-kitab, lima talbusoon al-haqqa bil-baatil? Oh, the people of the book, why do you confuse the truth with falsehood? وَتَكْتُمُونَ الْحَقَّ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ And you conceal the truth while you know the truth. Yeah. Why do you conceal the truth? And another verse, الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابِ Those whom we have given the book, meaning Christians and Jews, because they've received books and scripture. يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاهُمْ They know their books the same way they know their children. Mm-hmm. Can someone ever confuse his child, his son, with others? Yeah. No, he knows his, his son or daughter from within a thousand. Yeah. That's how well they know. Allah is telling them, you know your books more than anyone else. You won't confuse it. However, a group of you, a group of you Christians and Jews and the people of the book, you conceal the truth. You hide the truth. You don't show it to others. And another verse, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلْنَا مِنَ الْبَيِّنَاتِ Those who hide what we revealed from which is clear those who hide our clear verses huda, those who hide the guidance من بعد ما بيناه للناس في الكتاب after we have revealed the truth and guidance in the book أولئك يلعنهم الله ويلعنهم اللعنون those Allah will uh, curse them and those who curse will curse them this verse is not necessarily addressing Christians and Jews. Those who conceal. It's very general. It could include Christians and Jews and it could include others as we shall see. Possibly even from, from this nation, from Islam. Thus, we believe that the signs of Rasulullah were definitely in the Torah and in the Injil. That is why many Christians and Jews accepted Islam. Some accepted Others rejected. Those who rejected, one of the main reasons why they rejected is because their their priests, rabbis, monks, and religious leaders and scholars, they distorted the truth. Mm -hmm. They either took out these verses right away or they distorted them. They gave them another meaning. They provided them an alternative narrative for the meaning of these verses. In the famous story of Habira, the... 
the Christian monk, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, along with his uncle Abu Talib, they went to Damascus for business. For business, Rasulullah had taken money from Khadija. It was either in this incident or a prior incident. They went to Damascus. Rasulullah had taken money from Khadija to work with. Mm -hmm. And the prophets, they would share the prophets. Mm -hmm. And this is called mudaraba, prophet sharing. It was either when he met Khadija or before that. He went to Sham with his uncle Abu Talib. The caravan stopped at a church on the way. And there was a monk called Habira. He, he saw everyone. He saw this caravan. Of course, there was, this was before the advent of Islam. This was before Islam. He uh, hosted them. And he brought food. He brought dates. He brought dates and he told them this is sadaqah. Mm -hmm. Everyone ate except Rasulullah and Abu Talib. Except Rasulullah and Abu Talib. Habira, he saw that this is interesting. Because he had read in his books that the last messenger does not eat what? Sadaqah. Does not take sadaqah. Then he saw that Rasulullah sat next to a tree, a dead tree that had died. As soon as Rasulullah sat next to it, the tree blossomed it became green again this was sign number two he went and he checked he saw this is another sign three Rasulullah had a mole a mole on his back it was the seal of prophecy it was on his back and it would shine Habira went from behind him Rasulullah's clothing it removed his, his shoulder showed Habira noticed the sign. He said, Khalas, this is Rasulullah. He came to Abu Talib. He told him, who is this? He told him, this is my nephew. He told him, take care of him. This young man, Rasulullah was a teenager. He was a young man. He told him, take care of him because he has a very great future. He has a very great future. This is all in their books. It's in the Torah. It's in the Injil. It's in their scriptures. It's in their narrations. It's all in their sacred books. But they hid the truth. They hit the truth. Why? The question is, why would they conceal the yeah. truth? Why don't they? Why didn't they just accept the message of Rasulullah? It's in their books, and here, the books mention the qualities and descriptions of Rasulullah. Here you have a man that fits all the qualities and descriptions. Why not believe in him? Yeah. Why conceal the truth? The answer is very simple. These rabbis, these monks. Uh, these religious scholars, mm -hmm. for them religion was a business. Yeah. It was a business. If they were to show the truth and to admit that this is Rasulullah, they would have went out of business. Mm -hmm. They would have been bankrupt. These monks and rabbis and priests, they were living off of the people by telling lies, by concealing the truth. They were taking people's money in the name of salvation. This is in Western history, in European history. Read about the dark ages in Europe. The church would take money for salvation. They fooled people, thinking that if they paid the church, that priest, that father, the Pope, he has the right to grant them salvation, that they will enter heaven, they will not see hellfire, and their sins would be forgiven. This was a business for them. The Quran tells us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, inna kathiran min al-ahbari wal-ruhban layakuluna amwala al-nasi bil-batil wa yusudduna an sabirillah. O you who believe, the verse is talking to Muslims and non-Muslims as well. Even uh, Jews and Christians who believe in Allah. They believe in Allah. The verse is warning them that your monks, your rabbis, they're, they're stealing your wealth. They're making fools out of you. They're taking your money for no reason. And وَيُصُدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ They are now allowing you to reach Allah because they're, t they're concealing the truth. They're misguiding you. The, the right path is here. They're taking you 
left and right. Wake up. Thus, we see that the ver uh, these verses, the outer meaning, the outer meaning is tackling Jews and Christians and those who hid the truth. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting because, um, as historians say and scholars, uh, before Prophet Muhammad's uh, birth, there were signs for every prophet, especially those of bringing the book and revealing religions. There's signs, specific signs, just like to Moses and uh, to Jesus. But the Prophet Muhammad, um, there were specific signs in the sky, in the atmosphere of the world. So when the Jews realized it, they automatically they thought it was he was coming from them, from many Israel. But it turned out he came from the Arab. From the Arab. And for that reason, they they decided to fight him. Yeah, but uh, when you mentioned uh, it's significant how you mentioned. Ahl al-Bayt in, in the Bible. I did my, um, my bachelor's in, in religion uh, in Canada. And uh, there was a verse in Revelation 12 uh, which says there's a woman who holds, she wears a crown with 12 stars and the moon is beneath her feet. Mm. SubhanAllah, I mean, when, when it comes to explaining this verse, they say it's it's Jesus, it's um, Mary, Mary, Maryam, and uh, the moon is Jesus. And who are the twelve? The, the twelve disciples. Yeah. But when it comes to the actual meaning of it, we see that the only one who, who has twelve stars are Fatima Zahra and the twelve Imams. I mean, that's, that's significant. But uh, how did the pagans and why did the pagans conceal the truth uh, about Prophet Muhammad? <laughs> was sent to to everyone mm -hmm. but his message started in Mecca mm -hmm. it started in Mecca Rasulullah was an honest man he was truth telling he never lied he never stole anyone's money in fact he was trusted with people's money thus the people of Mecca knew who he was in addition to the fact that he had never read and wrote I won't say illiterate uh, even though the Quran calls him a Nabi al ummi the one who's illiterate. But there's a, there's a debate among scholars that Rasulullah, was he actually illiterate, meaning he, nev he didn't know how to read and write, or he never wrote, he never read. We believe that he knew how to read and write, but he didn't so that he will never be accused of writing the Quran. Anyhow, when he came with the message of Islam, people knew he was telling the truth. He was telling the truth. He had never lied in his life. He had never wrote in his life. How could he be? He was not a poet. How could he come with such eloquent words like the Quran? How could he write it himself? Sorry, they characterize him with uh, As-Sadiq Al-Amin. His name was As-Sadiq Al-Amin. Trustworthy. Thus, they knew he was telling the truth. Their youth, the people, the youth of Mecca, immediately began accepting the message of Rasulullah. It made sense. While the pagans of Mecca would worship idols, mm -hmm. some would worship dates. They, had, they made idols made out of dates, out of wood. Rasulullah comes with a, a bright message, a meaningful message. They all accepted him. So the only thing that the pagans of Mecca could do is conceal the truth. They made false propaganda against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rumors. They tried killing him and they, they passed out false rumors. Mm -hmm. He's a magician. He's a liar. He's insane. He's a sorcerer. So on and so forth. Only to conceal the truth. But it didn't work. It didn't work. Their propaganda, their false rumors did not work. Day after day, the people of Mecca accepted the message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was another example of concealing the truth. That's significant in itself because when we look at history, I mean, history is full of corruption, even with such a great, uh, with such uh, great characteristics that existed in history. Uh, but we see, especially Muslims, when it comes to Muslims, I mean, as Muslims and as our Prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu we should always try to bring out the truth. Yet. 
for we some see it's, reason it's being concealed it's being concealed I mean there, there's plenty of uh, incidents that have been concealed why because they say oh it's to bring the Ummah together that's their excuse but early Muslims why did they conceal the truth about, about Imam Ali peace be upon him you see, my, my dear viewers and my dear brother, this is, uh, this is what I meant when I said that the verse has an inner meaning. Mm -hmm. the, these verses that we read, وَلَا تَلْبِسُوا الْحَقَّ بِالْبَاطِلِ وَتَكْتُمُوا الْحَقَّ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Other verses. Uh, the outer meaning is looking at Christians and Jews. The inner meaning is looking at Muslims themselves. We in Muslim history, we saw concealment of, of the truth probably more than the truth concealed by Jews and Christians. Mm -hmm. And this did not just start after the death of Rasulullah While Rasulullah was alive, mm -hmm. there were some that were trying to conceal the truth. Let me mention a couple of incidents. Mm -hmm. The famous al Hadith al-Tayr al-Mashwi, mm -hmm. the, the tradition of the barbecued bird. Barbecued bird, that sounds pretty delicious. Alhamdulillah, we've broken our fast now, so we could go back for suhoran. Possibly find a barbecued bird. The hadith of the barbecued bird, a man, and this hadith has been mentioned in most sources. In Shia sources, all, and in most Sunni sources. Most Sunni sources. I want my dear viewers right now, as they listen to me, I want them to go Google hadith al tayr al mashwi and find it on Sunni source, in Sunni sources. Plenty. They'll find many sources. A man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and gave him a, a gift. He said, Ya Rasulullah, your lunch, today's on me. I brought you a barbecued bird. Rasulullah had a servant that would serve him by the name of Anas ibn Malik. He saw. He saw what's happening. He saw that Rasulullah received a gift. Rasulullah, when he saw this barbecued bird, this delicious meal, he didn't want to eat it by himself. He wanted to enjoy it with someone who he loves. Someone who he loves and he loves him and Allah loves both of them. He raised his hand. He said, Allahumma e'tini bi ahabbi al-khalq ilayk ya'kul ma'i hadha al-tayr. Oh Allah, send to me your best creation. After Rasulullah obviously, Send to me your best, the most beloved person to you. Ahabbul khalqi ilayk. Choose to me, send me the one that you love the most for him to eat with me. Hadith says immediately, Imam Ali came and knocked the door. The, the dua of Rasulullah was accepted, was answered. Anas opened the door. He said, Yes. He said, I'm here to see Rasulullah. Told him, Anas told him Rasulullah is busy. Busy? He said, Yes, he's busy. Come back at another time. Rasulullah saw that Imam Ali didn't come. Again, he raised his hand. Allahumma itini bi ahabbi al khalqi ilayk. Another knocking at the door. Imam Ali is back. Anas opened the door. He told him, I told you Rasulullah is busy. Mm -hmm. You see? You see how we, he tried to conceal? He saw, he heard the dua. He saw who came. Did he want it to cover up? Third time. Allahumma a'tini bi ahabb al khalq ilayk. Imam Ali came. He told him, let me in. Rasulullah heard the voice of Imam Ali. He told him, Ya Ali, come in. I prayed three times. What's been holding you back? He told him, Ya Rasulullah, this, this man, Anas. Anas has been holding me back. Rasulullah told him, why, Ya Anas? Why? Why are you holding him back? You saw me saying that dua. Anas. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I heard this beautiful dua. You, want, you asked Allah to send him your, his best creation, the most beloved person. I was hoping it's someone from my clan, someone from my tribe. So I was hoping Allah will send someone else. This is a hadith mentioned in most Sunni sources. Isn't this concealing the truth? This is only one. One story, one event that shows the envy towards Ali ibn Abi Talib that some of the Sahaba had. Some of the Sahaba had envy towards Ali ibn Abi Talib. And at every chance, 
where the virtues of Imam Ali were coming up, some were trying to conceal them, hid them. And another event that we see flat out concealment, the tragedy of Thursday, Raziyat, Yom Al Khamis, that has been mentioned in Sahih Al Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, in most Sunni sources. Rasulullah is on his bed, on his deathbed. He says, Bring me ink, bring me a feather, bring me something for me to write you. Aktub lakum kitaban lan tadullu ba'dahu abada. I will write you a will, you will never go lost. Umar ibn al Khattab comes up and he says, Inna rajula la yahjur. Inna rajula yahjur. Hasbuna kitab Allah. In Bukhari, and I've mentioned this in some of my lectures, Bukhari, when he came across the original version, Inna rajula la yahjur, the man is speaking nonsense. He saw that this is too much. He can't mention this. He changed. He changed. Some say that Bukhari is very trustworthy. No. This is one of the one of the incidents where he changes the hadith. Because if he writes the truth that Umar had stated, in Rajul Yajur, it makes Umar look very bad. Mm -hmm. He's saying Rasulullah speaks nonsense. So he changed the wording. In Rajul Ghalab alayhi al waja. The man is overwhelmed. The man, not the Prophet. All of a sudden he became an ordinary man. Inna rajul ghalaba alayhi al Rasulullah is overwhelmed with pain. Wa hasbuna kitab Allah. We have the book of Allah. We don't need the will of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We don't need his will. Hasbuna kitab Allah. Who brought the Quran other than Rasulullah? And this was a major tragedy. Yeah. A tragedy. Ibn Abbas would cry. He would say, Al-Raziyya, kullu al-Raziyya, ma hala baynana wa bayna kitab Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Tragedy, it was a major calamity, a tragedy. They, forbid us, for, they forbade us from receiving the will, the letter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Isn't this concealing the truth? And come and look at the excuses that they made for Umar ibn al-Khattab. That Umar was sympathetic towards Rasulullah. He saw Rasulullah was ill. He didn't want him to go through any trouble. Or he, uh, he was afraid that that will, Rasulullah will, will make such a difficult task for the Muslims and Allah will punish the Muslims because they, it's an overwhelming task. So out of sympathy for the Muslims, Umar ibn Khattab, come and look, listen to these jokes. I mean, so the excuses. They made Umar ibn Khattab no more than, than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If that's the case, then I don't know why Jibra'il went to Rasulullah. Why didn't he just go to Umar ibn al-Khattab? With all due respect, why didn't he just go and make, declare Umar ibn al-Khattab as Prophet? Since Umar ibn al-Khattab knew more than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa No. Uh, this was concealing the truth, unfortunately. This was concealing the truth. The Sahaba, they knew exactly what was going to be in that will. They had heard, they had heard similar wordings. إِنِّي تَارِكُمْ فِيكُمْ الثَّقَلَيْنِ كِتَابَ اللَّهُ وَعَتْرَةِ أَهْلَ بَيْتِ They knew it was something on that line. Maybe even bigger. Maybe by mentioning names. And they didn't want that to happen. Because that would have destroyed all the plans, all yeah, yeah, months plans. of planning. Months of planning. Even years of planning. Years of planning. And another incident, mm -hmm. we see concealment of the truth, concealment of the truth. And we want, you see, with, with, these, with these facts that we're mentioning, we, we don't mean any disrespect. We don't, we're not trying to uh, create a rift or disunity. No, we're trying to show the truth. We're obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by bringing out the truth. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not conceal the truth. Bring out the truth. Do not conceal the truth. And these are facts that must be stated. In another incident. And again, whatever I'm saying, this is not from Bihar al Anwar or Al Kafi or this is, you'll see these, and I want my dear viewers, as they're listening to me right now, I want them to Google. I want them to go on Google and look these stories up and find them in Sunni sources. In Sunni sources. And another incident. The day that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
passed away on. That morning for Salatul Fajr, Rasulullah was so tired, he wasn't able to get up for Salah. Some narrations say that who went to pray? Abu Bakr. Some narrations say that Abu Bakr went to pray. I have a lecture that did Abu Bakr actually pray or not? Did Abu Bakr lead the Salah or not? It's on YouTube. Those who wish to listen to it can listen to it. Now, uh, whether he prayed or not, who told him? Who told him? Was it Rasulullah? Definitely not. It wasn't Rasulullah who told him. Because in, in some narrations, when Rasulullah heard the voice of Abu Bakr leading the Salah, he came and he removed him. He grabbed him by his hand and he put him back to the first row and he led the Salah. Some narrations say that he led the Salah while sitting. If he had told him to pray, why would he tell him to step back and be a follower and not a leader? Some narrations, if we, gather, if we look carefully at the narrations, we see that Rasulullah wanted to ask for Imam Ali. He wanted Imam Ali to lead the Salah that day. However, Aisha and Hafsa were in the house of Rasulullah. Rasulullah asked for Ali ibn Abi Talib. Get me Ali ibn Abi Talib. I want Ali ibn Abi Talib. Aisha tells him, should I call Abu Bakr? He said, no. Hafsa says, should I call Umar? He said, no. I want Ali ibn Abi Talib. I didn't ask for anyone else. The narration says that Abu Bakr, and if you want the sources, listen to that lecture. It's on YouTube. I delivered this, I delivered it this Muharram. Did Abu Bakr lead the Salah? I've mentioned all the Sunni sources. Abu Bakr and Umar, they showed up at the house of Rasulullah. They told him, he told them, what are you doing here? I didn't call you. If I needed you, I will call you. I didn't call you. And then he looked at his wives. Aisha and Hafsa. And all Sunni sources mention this, this sentence. He said, Yusuf. You, he, he likened them. He said, you are similar to the woman that, that seduced Yusuf. The woman that seduced Yusuf and tried to get him to fornicate with them and commit adultery, they were called Suwayhibat Yusuf. Rasulullah is calling his wife, Inna kunna lu Yusuf. What, is, what, 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 what does this mean? Mm -hmm. Is Rasulullah accusing them, God forbid? No, of course not. He's not accusing them of adultery or fornication. He's telling them that the same way they committed a crime, a sin, you also committed a sin. You also committed a sin. You act in a deceitful way. The same way that those women, they acted in a deceitful way. They concealed the truth. Rasulullah wants Ali ibn Abi Talib. They hushed. They called someone else. This is during the life of Rasulullah. These incidents all took place during the life of Rasulullah. They're trying to conceal the truth. Let alone what happened. God knows what happened after the death of Rasulullah. And one famous incident, all historians agree. This is not, I'm not making a claim. This is not an allegation. All historians agree that Umar ibn al-Khattab burnt all the books of hadith, all the books of hadith, 10 days after, a couple of weeks, maybe two, three weeks after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi they said whoever has written the ahadith of Rasulullah, bring them. They didn't tell them what's happening. Bring the books. Bring the books. They wanted to collect them. They wanted to collect all the sayings of Rasulullah, all the traditions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Whoever had written, this person had a book, another person had two books, this sahabi had two, three. They gathered all of the books. What did they do with them? Publish them, put them in a special library, make copies of them and spread them everywhere. They burnt these books. They burnt the books of hadith. 
What was their excuse? Their excuse was, we don't want people to later generations to confuse the Quran with Hadith. We're afraid that future generations they'll not be they will not be able to distinguish between the Quran and Hadith. So the best thing to do is burn all of the Hadith. Does this make sense? Isn't this concealing the truth? Because in every hadith, almost all of the narrations of Rasulullah, they shout the name of the Ahlul Bayt. Yeah. They scream the shout of, they scream That's the name of the Imam Ali and the name of, and the remembrance of Ahlul Bayt, the mentioning of Ahlul Bayt. That is what they were trying to conceal. Yeah. Because there was a political agenda. There was a political agenda. And if these narrations would have reached further generations, that, that would not look good for them. Definitely. That's the best thing for them was to conceal the truth. To burn the truth. To burn the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those who conceal the truth that's in the book in the book and they make money off of it you see we have uh, we have several narrations that say the Quran has been distorted the Quran has been distorted even though we the followers of Ahlul Bayt we believe the Quran and its words the words of the Quran have not been distorted they have not been distorted and this is a fact. All of our scholars agree. Now, if you ask any of our scholars, they all agree the Quran has not been distorted, even though some of our scholars have been accused. Yes, we believe that the meanings of the Quran have been distorted. The words have not been distorted, but its meanings. Mm -hmm. This verse was revealed about the Ahlul Bayt. You see them, they distort it. Yeah. They say that it was revealed about so and so this verse was revealed about Imam Ali they come and distort it they distort the meaning not the words the words are still there yeah. the words are there for example prime example mm -hmm. we believe that this verse was revealed regarding Ahl al-Bayt as the as the verse the, specifically they say the verse is speaking about whom the wives of Rasulullah the wives of Rasulullah. This is and the yaktumuna ma anzar Allah min al kitab. This is distorting. This is concealing the truth. The verses regarding Ahlul Bayt, they say no, it's regarding the wives of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Thus, these verses in their outer meaning, we see they're addressing Christians and Jews and the people of the book. But I feel that. It's addressing us, yeah. the Muslim nation. We it's addressing the, the, the nation of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. We conceal the truth. And this is how millions of people, they went astray. Yeah. This is how millions of people, they don't know the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt. They haven't accepted the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt. If they knew the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt, they would have came. Before we conclude, I want to mention to you, how some Muslim scholars conceal the truth. Mm -hmm. They conceal the truth. There's a lot of historians, a lot of mufassireen, a lot of theologians. And many have distorted the truth. Many have concealed the truth. So many narrations that speak in the name of Imam Ali. They came, they changed the meanings. Mm -hmm. For example, Hadith al-Ghadir. Man kuntu mawla, fahada aliyu mawla. They can't deny this event because 100,000 sahab, Sahaba they stood at Ghadir Khum and they gave allegiance to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Thus, they can't conceal the, the incident. That the they can't because a verse came down. Ya'i Rasulu ballagh ma unzul ilayk. And 100,000 Sahabi they, they, narrate, uh, they, they were present. They, they were present. And over 110 of them they narrated a story. Thus, they couldn't seal the incident. But what they do is they come and they play around with the words. Yeah. They conceal the meaning. Men kuntu mawla, fahada ali mawla. Mawla means friend. 
whoever I was his friend, I was his helper, Ali ibn Abi Talib is his helper. You see, isn't this concealing the truth? This was not my point. The story that I'd like to mention is Al-Tabari, mm -hmm. the famous Sunni scholar, has two books. He has a tafsir and he has a tarikh. He has an exegesis of the Quran and he has a history book, Tariq al-Umam wal Muluk. In his history book, in his history book, he mentions the following story that after the after the advent of Islam, after Rasulullah received the first revelation, he gathered all of his family members. When Allah revealed the following verse, وَأَنذَرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِ He gathered all of his uh, family members, he delivered a lecture, he told them that I have been sent with Islam. They gave them a lecture, at the end, he said, who will be with me and help me? مَنْ مِنْكُمْ يُعَازِرَنِي عَلَى هَذَا الْأَمْرِ عَلَى أَنْ يَكُونَ أَخِي وَوَصِيِّ وَخَلِيفَتِي فِيكُمْ who will help me with propagating Islam mm -hmm. so that he will be my heir, my brother, and my successor? And then he mentions that Ali ibn Abi Talib stood. Ali ibn Abi Talib was a couple of... Youth. Yeah, he was maybe 11 years old. 10 or 11 years old. He stood up. Rasulullah, after three times he told him, sit down. He wanted others to speak. When they didn't, Rasulullah holds his hand and he said, إِنَّ هَذَا أَخِي وَوَصِيِّ وَخَلِيفَتِي فِيكُمْ فَاسْمَعُوا لَهُ وَأَطِيعُوهُ This is my heir, my brother and my successor. So listen to him and obey him. This is in his history. When it comes to his tafsir, subhanAllah, shaitan comes and plays with, with his mind. Instead of stating the full truth, he said that Rasulullah got up and he held the hand of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, who will help me to be my heir, my successor, and my brother? He said, only Ali ibn Abi Talib stood up. So he grabbed Imam Ali's hand. وقال, and he said, إن هذا أخي و و و إلى آخره. He said, this is my brother. And, and, and blah, blah, blah. Mention, Why? mention the rest of the hadith. Oh, two words left. He said he's my heir and he's my successor. No. Shaitan came to him. Shaitan came, told him, don't write it. Don't. He has it in his tarikh, in his history book, but he won't mention it in his tafsir. This is, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَكْتُمُونَ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ This is concealing the truth. This is tragic. This is concealing the truth. SubhanAllah. When coming to see, um, as you mentioned, they when it comes to actually reading narrations, a lot of narrations that are about Imam Ali, peace be upon him, they put them to someone else. I mean, closing the doors of, of the doors leading to the, to the mosque of Rasulullah, to the masjid, they say Prophet Muhammad closed all the doors except for the door of Abu Bakr. I mean, <laughs> the door that was closed. Was a book of uh, door, Ahsan. and the one that was open was the door of Ali ibn Abi Talib. But it's significant to see that uh, the reason behind the corruption that we are seeing today is concealing the truth. But the, an incident that was not actually not only concealing the truth, but led to the death of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him, where they led th hundreds of thousand soldiers to kill Aba Abdullah. They say he was a, he was a Khawarij. 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 and they took him to Sham. Some say to Egypt, and all, and they were throwing rocks and insulting them. In the name of Khawarij, the they didn't know that this was the ha the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Subhanallah. I mean, we see it's it's so weird. And it was only when Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam who gave his famous sermon, "Ana ibn Makkah ta wa mina, ana ibn Zamzam wa Safa," until he says. That I'm the son of Rasulullah, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Fatima al-Zahra, Khadija, al Hussein. That's when people became sympathetic. Otherwise, the truth was concealed. They were Khawarij and they deserve to be killed. SubhanAllah. 
even until now, I mean, with all the channels that broadcast the truth, some people call it false because it doesn't go with their you know, personal agendas or what they have been taught and brainwashed with. Even now, when uh, Muslims and non-Muslims, when they embrace the path of Ahlul Bayt, the path of righteousness, they feel sad because, because they realize that they haven't been told the truth. So, say that we actually came to a conclusion today, uh, inshallah, the discussion was very wonderful. Alhamdulillah. And inshallah, we can continue the next episode. Alhamdulillah. Uh, respected viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam, I would like to thank you for watching uh, this episode. Uh, stay tuned for the next episode, inshallah. Don't forget to uh, check out our YouTube channel and also join us for the discussion with Sayyid Hussein Khazwini by asking questions. Uh, in our YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, WhatsApp, there's a lot. So, uh, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahsantum. Allah yassalamu alaikum, inshaAllah.